And, and I'm tired of doing that. I'm, I'm tired of spending the majority of my life in the dark. And like you've heard me say on several occasions, the majority of my life looked like this. I made my decisions on assumptions. And I often felt like I was in the dark, but I never asked questions. And I've learned it, and I heard it said many, many years ago, there's no such thing as a dumb question. There's only one dumb question. That's the one that's not asked. And I had to be honest with myself when I was learning about cocaine um, in the 80s and crack came onto the scene in ways I have never seen before. I didn't really quite understand what's the difference here, but I asked questions. I asked questions, well, what's the difference between the powder and the rock? I didn't understand what you were doing in the corner when you had that syringe in your hand. So I started to ask some questions. I didn't understand why this particular bar watered down their drinks. So I asked somebody, what bar doesn't water down drinks? So I asked some questions. But then I came into these rooms and I didn't ask any questions. I came in here late and I left early. And my hope when I came is that you really wouldn't notice me. That you wouldn't notice me and you wouldn't check up on me and you wouldn't ask me how I was doing. But as soon as you didn't ask me how I was doing, I was wondering why you weren't paying attention to me. So I set up these barricades around my life um, to keep people out, but I was extremely lonely, and I believed the lie that people just weren't accepting me to come in. But the truth of the matter is, is the fellowship of AA, NA, CA, CMA, SA, GA, they always welcome me in. And I think that's awesome. I think that's awesome, but I was known as a chronic relapser. So the good sponsors back in the day, when I come back in, they still welcome me, but they became a little harder on me. And they said, what gives you permission to think that you can use? It ain't okay to use. And they stopped coddling me, and they started to confront some issues within me, and for the first time in my life, I allowed somebody to confront me. I didn't quit. I didn't put up the middle finger. I didn't tell them to go, you know what, themselves. I didn't leave the place and talk bad about it like a lot of people do. I don't know why anybody would ever talk bad about an organization that's trying to help people. And the organization that's trying to help people are full of people like me that aren't perfect. So at least give them credit for trying to help. They're not going to do it perfect. I'm not going to do it perfect. You're not going to do it perfect. But I was the type of guy that I wanted to hold people to standards that I couldn't even keep. And that was my out. Once you, kept a, once you let me down on a standard that I couldn't even walk in, I thought you were a fake. I thought you were a fraud. I met with a friend of mine last night. And he, he paid respect. And he's, he's in our program. And he's got a great dreams. And he's a man of integrity and character. And... He, he said to me, he says, you know how these guys are, man. They talk smack about you. And I think to myself, I mean, I'm a human being. I mean, I, I'm not perfect, and, but I do give it my all. And that's why I love when Eric Brew comes with a level of understanding. For 14 solid years, my children have given up time for me, for me to be here to teach you. And I know that you cannot keep what you have unless you give it away. And I know that somebody gave it away to me, so my obligation and privilege is to give it away to someone else. But I also understand, and my children understand, and we're going to talk about understanding tonight. My children understand that regardless of what this is going to look like, there's going to be pain. There's going to be pain that I'm not going to be, I didn't go to your, your you know, my kids are grown, they're 19, 20, and, and I think Nikki's 24 now, correct? Pretty, I'm doing good. <laughs> And, um, and, and the years fly by, but I didn't go to their games when I was smoking crack. But I also have missed some games when they were playing sports when I was sober, because I had to go to my meeting. I had to go to church. I had to function. So they had to understand, and I, had to, and, 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 and I couldn't expect them to understand at that phase of their life, why can't you be here? Why do you have to go to your meeting? You're not using anymore. They didn't understand. I couldn't expect them to understand but I had to know inside my heart that I understand that either way, either they're going to be talking to me through glass or in a high secured visiting room in prison or they're going to be talking to me over a tombstone. 
So either I could lead them to that type of pain, or I could lead them to the pain that I know you don't understand, but later on in life you will. And later on in life you understand that you will come to me for advice because I've learned how to give advice because someone has given it freely to me. And the advice I'm giving you isn't mine. It's what I've learned in the Word of God. So what I've learned over the years is this. That as long as I have a level of understanding, as long as I know what my purpose is, and we're, we're in the middle of a series on purpose, and over the last... Um, five weeks we've been talking about purpose. A purpose is so when you walked into this room tonight, you have the same chance of giving, getting 13 and five years as Pastor Jed and Eric do. There's no difference. It's the same tools, the same God, the same community, the same steps. It's all the same. It doesn't matter where you've been up until this point. The solution is one. The solution is the same. It isn't your program. It isn't my program. It's the program. But I like to put a little sugar on top of it. I like to modify the steps. I like to do the steps out of order back in the day. And every time, every time I did that, it led to relapse. So I had to come to the conclusion. And then I got stuck for many, many years. As a believer with no relationship with God, um, I never understood what God's will was for me. I never understood what God's purpose was for me. But I started with what his purpose isn't. His purpose isn't for me to leave my children. His purpose is not for me to spend my life in prison. His purpose is not for me to die at a young age. His purpose is not for me to smoke crack and lie and manipulate, sell dope, sell people, do whatever I was doing at the, at the given time of my life is the fact that my purpose isn't those things. So I just started with that. And the definition on your sheet says you're set up. So each and every one of you right now, if you're here, is set up to be successful. Secondly, it talks about for something to be attained. We know at the end of your life you will have one thing and one thing only. Leanne talked to me about it on Sunday. The only thing that will sit in that urn or that casket with you is your character. Not any of your belongings. It'll be your name. And when I got here, my name was dirt. My name was thief. My name was terrible father. My name was dope dealer. My name was loser. But God has restored my name. And he says he can do that for each and every. Now, not everybody will see it like God sees it or I see it, but I had to start paying attention to God versus my haters. I had to start paying attention to who God says I am, and I suggest you do the same. So it says the reason why something is done on your sheets. Now, I've done a lot of LSD, a lot of cocaine, obviously a lot of marijuana, drank a lot of booze, did a lot of opiates, heroin, benzos over the years. So my mind should be fried. And quite frankly, I think it is. But when I talk to you, I can remember because the Bible says I will bring remembrance in your time of need. So here I am, a chronic drug addict, almost reading verbatim off the sheet that you have in front of you without looking at the sheet. I give God the glory for that. But on your sheet, it says this. The reason why something is done. We got to stop doing things not on purpose. Well, I didn't get drunk this weekend on purpose. Well, then why did you get drunk if you didn't do it on purpose? Why well, didn't lie on purpose? Well, why did you lie if you didn't do it on purpose? So if you're going to be a person of purpose, you have to start doing things on purpose. And, and, and what it says now is so true. Um, and, and that if you're just going to exist in your recovery, you're going to get high. You, you cannot just exist in these rooms. It's not enough. You have to taste freedom. The first week I talked about positioning. Um, the definition on your sheets on positioning is arranging. That God has arranged you to be here. And you may not want to be here tonight, but there are a lot worse places for you to be than here. So get out of your head. There's so much better than here. Start saying there's a lot worse places. And you've been, and so have I, to those places. So God arranged for you to be here, and back in the day, 14 years ago, my mom arranged for me to live in a sober house. My mom arranged for, for her to pay the rent for me, and I was grateful for that. But then later on, the devil said, well, God, you're a grown man, your mom's got to pay rent. I was grateful that she was able to do that. I was grateful. Uh, I, I always get a little confused um, when guys like me go back to work, and um, we're complaining about taxes and our paycheck. I mean, look at how much public money we have wasted through Rule 25s and detox centers, food stamps, or whatever it may be. So I can't complain about 
um, taxes. One of Bishop Jake's guy out of the prison fellowship program, one of the funniest things I've ever heard, he was so upset because he did not know who this FICA person was taking money out of his check. He thought it was like a debt collector. So God has arranged for us to be here, so we have to position ourselves to be here. Um, it says in order. So we came here to learn order. We're very disorderly. Um, we feed off disorder. We love chaos. We're addicted to chaos. The definition of position is in order. Um, it, it also says, I believe on your sheet, where you're located. When you start to get sober, people should be able to find you. It shouldn't be a mystery. Well, if you're in a sober house and there's several sober houses represented under the sound of my voice, um, when you fill out a weekend pass, well, why do you need to know where I'm going? Well, what's the, who cares? If you're going where you say you're going to go, what does it matter if we know you're there? Same reason why I see guys that are, should be doing 10 years in the penitentiary complaining to me about the color wheel in the UA and the PO meetings. Like, well, who cares if you got to take a UA if you're clean? Why should that offend you? That's a level of accountability that is needed for you. And now the definition of position says that God will not, if, if, if you don't take advantage for God arranging for you to be somewhere, he'll put you somewhere. It says it on your sheets. God will put you in prison through your actions. You put yourself there. He'll put me at 1800 um, Detox, Plymouth uh, Mission Detox, all of them. I've been to all of them. So he'll put me some, but also it says a, a definition of position is um, more or less your point of view, your perspective. Sometimes we like to hold on to things in our minds that hinder us. It's easy for us to hold on to things that are hindering us. The second week, I believe we talked about exposure. The definition of exposure is an, uh, a revelation of an identity or fact about who you are as a person. So when we get here, we lead with our gifts. We need lead with our nice guys. That we're newcomers. We're grateful that we're above ground and out of prison. But eventually that gratitude fades. So then we find out, oh man, that brother's got a temper. Oh man, that brother's a liar. Oh man, that brother stole some money from me and he's stone sober. So there's, there's revelations about your identity and my identity that you're trying to conceal because you're afraid if they're, if they're revealed, they'll be met with disapproval. I'm going to give you an example of that. My friend who's under the sound of my voice just got out of federal prison. While he was in federal prison, we stood with him. Before he went to federal prison, we stood with him. When he got out of treatment, we stood with him. We haven't stopped standing with him. But what happens is your mind gets a little crazy once in a while. So he called me up this week, and I asked him if I could talk about it. I'm not going to give you the guy's name, but some of you are not, you know, that, that. Well, I'll leave it alone. But anyways, <laughs> so he called me this week, and he says, I, 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 I call, he called me, and I said, why are you backing up, man? Why are you backing up? And, and this is a grown, successful man. And he says, well, I felt like I wasn't wanted anymore. I said, well, what made you think that? He says, I don't know, but I felt it, and I thought it, and I went with it. I said, but you know what tells me that you're a man, that you're talking to me about it? Because boys don't talk to you about it, they just bolt. And I said, well, what made you think that? Do you have any evidence to reinforce your theory about that? No, not really. But what we learned with exposure is, and through the devil of opposition, that you will begin to see things differently once your mind shift happens and you, you'll, you'll say, well, all oh, that they don't like or this or I don't like these rules or this, that, and the other. But a real man will come to you and say, hey, man, something's changed in my mind and I need help with it. Because if we were good at sorting things out, I don't think we would be in the situations that we're in. So we need somebody to help us. In the third week, we talked about routine. If you're going to be sober, you have to develop a routine. You shouldn't be the one that, that, that puts the routine in place. It should be your sponsor. Back in the day, I don't know if they do it anymore, we used to do 90 and 90s. And those were important meetings to have because that, that you brought a routine. A routine is defined on your sheets as a fixed program, something established procedure, something regularly followed. Um, Eric's followed the routine. Pastor Jed has followed the routine for 13 years. Now, we have to be intelligent enough to look at these two examples of following a routine that it works. Right. And it's not just about sobriety. That you may even get interviewed, and it's not about notoriety, in the 700 Club and be, have 200 people accept Jesus because of your addiction. 
You never know why your mother-in-law, because your routine, would come to your church and ask the pastor of your church to baptize her and now wanted me to do her funeral. You'll never know the effect of your routine. And it's fixed, and it's a program, and it's a procedure, and it goes against everything that we like. Because we like to do what we want to do when we feel like doing it. You're not going to recover if you continue to live like that. The, the fourth week, we talked about um, power. That in the third step, when you make a decision to turn your will and your life over to the care of God as you understand him, we, lear we learned in the video, do you understand do you, I mean, maybe some of you will understand, how is that light, how, how many volts does it take for that fan to go around? I mean, I don't get caught up in all that chaos. I'm going to turn my life over the same thing Eric Brew turned his life over, because I just saw Eric Brew get five years. So I'm going to ask Eric Brew the question, how do you turn your life over to the care of God? Because I don't understand him. So a guy like Eric Brew will show me how to do it. How do you know if you turn your life over to the care of God as you understand him, and your will over the care of God as you understand him? Well, if you work a four-step. You don't get stuck on a four-step for six months. You're stuck on a four-step for six months because you don't want to work a four-step. And somebody needs to be in your life to tell you the truth about that. Oh, it's okay. I know it's hard to look at your fears. <laughs> your resentments. I know, I know. That ain't a sponsor. That's a babysitter. If you want a babysitter in these rooms, they're not in this room. But if you want a sponsor that's not going to tell you what you want to hear, but what you need to hear, they're all over this room. So we talked about tapping into the power of God. We know about the power of our addiction. They teach us in treatment. It's cunning, baffling, and powerful. So I had to learn about the power of God. If the power of God could remove my desire to smoke crack, the power of God can deal with my depression, my anxiety, my angers, my fears, and my resentments. More or less, I'm tapping into the power of God by becoming entirely ready to have God remove my defects of character, by humbly ask God in the seventh step to re remove my shortcomings, I'm tapping more into the power of God by sought through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact with God, praying only for the knowledge of his will and the power to carry that out. So I know about his power. His power got me sober. His power has kept me sober. His power has kept me in my family. His power has kept me in my job. His power has kept me from lying. His power has kept me from lying. you got to understand, his power is designed to keep you from you. It takes God's power to keep you from yourself. And you got to get to know yourself so you can see yourself coming. So last week we talked about opposition. The definition of opposition on your streets, on your sheet says something that's opposing you. It, it could be somewhat hostile. Um, it, 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 it can be um, really just coming against you. It could be your greatest grief. But you have to understand that sometimes we blame the addiction or the devil for something you're doing. Because if we're honest with ourselves, we're our own worst enemies. So we, we don't need anybody else beating on us because we're beating on ourselves. So the opposition works in your mind. It's an attack on your mind. It was an attack on my friend's mind to tell him he does not want it here anymore. That was an attack on his mind, and he knew it was an attack on his mind. And the reason why I know he knew it was an attack on his mind, that he talked to me about the attack on his mind. If you don't think it's an attack on your mind, you're not going to talk about it. The best way to shut the devil's mouth is to open yours. He opened his mouth, and it shut the devil's mouth. See, we got to understand, I say it all the time, I've been saying it for years, why don't you just not listen to the devil just like you don't listen to God? Why do we believe the truth, the lie over the truth? And I'm coming to you with straight biblical truth tonight, and so we have these things. So this week I want to talk to you about understanding. Eric started by saying it, and he said, Tommy, Megan, Nikki, and Jackson have an understanding of what their parents are called to do. And they didn't have an understanding of why their dad smoked crack and abandoned them for drugs and lived on the streets of Minneapolis and St. Paul around this country in different states because dope was more important to them. They didn't understand that. But it wasn't in my heart. My kids were more important than my dope, but the dope had the authority over my kids. And once the dope took authority over my kids through my actions, the, the legal system got involved and started taking authority over my kids. So we have to understand that an understanding on your sheet says a mental grasp. So don't be disheartened if anything I'm saying up here doesn't make sense. It's going to take time. I didn't understand when I walked into these rooms 
Well, why, if I sit in a, they're talking about some step I don't understand, they're showing me some book I don't even know if I want to understand, and how can possibly me sharing my feelings keep me out of the dope house? I don't understand how that would work. But I stick and I stayed because I saw guys like Eric. I saw guys like Pastor. And I couldn't deny the fruit even though I was a conspiracy theory guy. There's more. He's probably getting high in the bathroom right now. Now he's up there getting his chip. <laughs> so a lot of my time in these rooms was sizing everybody else up, like some of you are doing to me right now. <laughs> Watching every move everybody's making. So we have to have a level of understanding. Eventually you will grasp this, so don't be discouraged. It says the power of comprehending. Remind yourself in the third step when you turn your will and your life over to the care of God, if you've done that, um, then you're tapping into his power and it's God's power that will help you comprehend. But I, once you truly get free, this is what it's called, the capacity to apprehend general relations. You have to have relations with people. You have to show like you're somewhat interested in another person's life. And you need to ask them about particulars. Are you okay? Every, I, I must have said that to 30 people today. Something just didn't seem right. It, see, you know what? It's okay not to be okay. But what's not okay is to pretend that you're okay when you're not okay. That's what these rooms are for. So, so, so it says that in particular about people's feelings, and, and now it says to be aware of other people's feelings, um, tolerant and forgiving. I often I had to, I just had to get checked one year when, when I would expect everyone to forgive me, but if you did something to me, I wasn't going to forgive you. And that goes against biblical principle because God says, if you don't forgive them, I ain't forgiving you. And people like us that just warrant all this forgiveness and, and it says the truth you stand under the reason why I smoked crack as long as I did because I stood under a lie I stood under the lie that I would never get sober I stood under the lie that I would never be able to see my kids I stood under the lie that I'd never get my finances in order I stood under the lie that I'd never get back in the business world I, I stood under the lie but the, the, the really the definition of understanding is what are you standing under are you standing under the understanding of somebody that has gone before you and has got the t-shirt to prove it? Will your, because if you turn your will and life over to the care of God as you understand them, God uses people. And quite frankly, I'm not even there yet. So I don't have such a divine connection with God that like, okay, God, what, okay, thanks for telling me what to do. God, what do you want me to do here with my wife? Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. You know, yes, I go to his word. But I go to my mentor, and he's been doing this for 27 years. And he's one of the few guys I know that's got um, more years out of addiction than he had in addiction. So you really can't claim to have understanding until you've done this longer than you did that. So, so it says, now check this out, Proverbs 4, 7, spiritual understanding is going to cost you. It says, the, the, it says more or less on your sheets, the first sign of wisdom is to more or less come to the understanding that you need wisdom. I don't think you can walk into a room like this and claim that you do not need wisdom when your best thinking got you here. And that's a hard truth to, to digest. But it says, the, the more or less on your sheets, it says the beginning of wisdom is to get wisdom. First I had to realize that I needed wisdom, and that was wisdom to know that I needed wisdom. But check out what it says here. Though it may cost you all you have, just like your addiction did. Though it may cost you all you have, get understanding. It's going to take time. It's going to take effort, and it's going to take sacrifice. But just like your addiction cost you everything you had, this is going to cost you. This is going to cost you, and I'm going to tell you what it's going to cost you. 2 Corinthians, spiritual understanding costs you as much as your addiction. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves. What did he say tonight? If you're going to be sober, you've got to be of service. You have to be of service. So, so in, understanding is going to cost you great endurance and troubles, hardships, and distresses. Um, your addiction cost you in troubles, hardships, and distresses, but you still did it. How much trouble did your addiction in, cause in hardships and distresses, but I kept getting high? In beatings. 
This is going to cost you. It's going to cost you. Your addiction beat you down. Imprisonment. Our addiction, for some of us, cost us our freedom. We were like caged animals. So when you became a caged animal, you had a different level of understanding. Then we kept getting high. So it's going to cost you that. Riots, hard work, sleepless nights and hunger. Did your addiction ever cost you any of that? So yes, you might have to stay here like 25 addicts did on Saturday night, break down after marrying two junkies to set up for church. Yeah, it might cost you some sleep, your level of understanding. As soon as your recovery gets as much time and money as your addiction did, you're getting close to freedom. See, addiction, it, it, understanding patience and kindness. In my addiction, I was extremely patient. I'll be there in 10 minutes. You said you were going to be here in 10 minutes. That was an hour ago. I'll be there in 10 minutes, patiently waiting. But now we're, this meeting's getting too long? When some of us waited patiently for several hours that should have been 10 minutes to buy some bunk dope? I mean, let's come real with it. Waiting patiently for the bar to open or the liquor store to open? So we, 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 we learn that type of understanding in our addiction, and it says the Holy Spirit was sincere love. Eventually, you're going to learn to love yourself and other people and God in a sincere manner once you gain understanding. Truthful speech, the power of God, the weapons of righteousness. It says now in Proverbs 3, it says spiritual understanding requires, requires trust in God. A lot of people that have trust issues, the reason why they have trust issues is they don't trust themselves. So... I have been doing this for a while now. I have more reason not to trust people, and I've learned distrust in the rooms of these rooms than I did on the streets. I have been betrayed more, and I don't say this for you to leave the room. I'm just telling you the real honest-to-God truth. I have been betrayed, and that's what my friend and I were talking about last night when he thanked me for everything that he's had, that we participated in that with him. He said, I don't know how you handle it. These guys saying one thing and do, doing another, they say they're in, and then they leave without saying goodbye, and once they leave, they want to talk smack. So how do you even trust anybody anymore? Well, I don't know. How can you live your life without trusting? So I trust the next new guy. And he may screw me over, but I trust him because I trust God to take care of me in light of all of it. Amen. It says, do not lean on your own understanding. We lean on things that kill us. It says, submit to, to God in all your ways and he will make your path straight. When I got here, my path was extremely crooked. And in order to be committed, you first have to be submitted to the level of understanding of another human being to teach you understanding. It says in Jeremiah 3.15, the person that is, is a mentor or a leader. The Bible says that I will give you shepherds. That's somebody that's going to lead you in knowledge and understanding. A lot of people get upset with the people that are trying to lead them in knowledge and understanding. They don't have enough common sense to understand that the devil's trying to get you to trip about the person that God has selected to save your life. Have enough common sense to know that. If you don't like where you are right now, you're exactly where you need to be. Because the devil's going to spin a spin on your head. And you're going to start looking at the differences versus similarities. Have enough knowledge and common sense to know that, man, I'm really supposed to be here because everything inside of me is screaming to run. So we got to understand that God gives and sends and positions people. It says in Isaiah 29, spiritual understanding requires instruction. It says those who are wayward in spirit, those people that are hard control, do whatever they feel like doing. Check out what the Bible says. They will gain understanding. You know when people like that gain understanding? When they're incarcerated. You'll gain understanding. And it goes on to say this. Um, those who complain with, will accept instruction. Eventually you're going to accept instruction because I'm not coming to your side of the street on this lie. I know what the UA says. So you're going to have to receive this instruction. If you don't receive it here, you're going to go receive it over there. But ultimately, you're eventually going to have to accept instruction. So why wait till you get to prison to accept it? Accept it now or accept it later? I would much rather accept it from Doug, who is not a warden, but some of you guys think he is. And it's like, like Doug's your enemy. He's working out of the kindness of his heart without getting paid to do it tirelessly for 40 to 60 hours a week just to try to help you. Why, that Doug's a jerk. <laughs> Who does he think he is coming into this house and giving me a UA? Well, he's trying to help you. 
And when you were new, before something was revealed about the real you, you said, hey man, I'm an open book. <laughs> Whatever you need. A couple weeks later, nobody's in your business. Right. Recovery is about people being in your business and you have to come to that level of understanding. Job 17.4, spiritual understanding requires an open mind. Some people don't even want to understand. And because they don't want to understand, they'll never triumph. They'll never rise above. Um, everything is limited. Um, you know, I'm tired of losing and building and losing and building and losing and building. I had to gain understanding. Proverbs 17, spiritual understanding requires knowledge. The one who has knowledge uses words with restraint. You know how many times in a given day, especially in these rooms, I want to tell somebody what time it is, that they're just so free-flowing about their opinions with no leg to stand on? Man, I could just slice them. And, and trust me, there's a side of me that ain't nothing nice. But I can't. Because I'm not going to lose my testimony. I have a different level of understanding that makes me restrain from some of this stuff. Whoever has understanding is even tempered. Man, I, I have people praying for me for many years in these rooms that I do not lose my temper. I'm telling you. Ask my mom. It ain't nothing nice. But I've come to the conclusion I'm not going to jail over you. That's understanding. Why would I put myself in jail because I was upset with you and I wanted to have a hot temper over you? That is a lack of understanding. It makes absolutely no sense. It says in Proverbs 15:32, um, under, I, I, well, I'll tell you a story when I first met Monica and we went to Van Morrison, but we ain't got time. Praise God. <laughs> She saw a side of me that was nothing nice. And I was calling in the road dogs and it wasn't good. Early, early on. <laughs> Understanding requires discipline. Those who disregard discipline, those that do not work the steps, those who do not have a sponsor, despise themselves. They hate themselves. They won't admit it, but only the ones expressing opinions. Now, we don't need the opinion of somebody in these houses. We've been doing this for 14 years. Either you're in or you're out. We're not perfect, nor are you, so let's try to do this together. But if this didn't work, we wouldn't be here 14 years later with thousands of lives. But people that don't have understanding, they just want to give you their opinion about everything. I mean, I don't go into rooms that are people that are elevated above me and give my opinion. I keep my mouth shut and I listen to what they have to say because I want the level of understanding that they have. So opinions really mean nothing. Quite frankly, opinions are based on assumptions. I would rather deal with facts. And your assumption may be in a fact, so ask for clarity. It says in Mark 4, now it says, it's time to turn to understanding. It says so that... May you be seen, but never perceived. You've seen a lot of things in the rooms for many years, but you never perceived what was really happening here. You've been to meetings. You know the meetings. Check this out. Even hearing, you've heard the seventh, third, ninth, twelfth, first, second step a million times, and you're still high. You're still high. Still relapsing. And it says it right here. Hearing but never understanding. I don't understand why I have to go to group and go to group and express my feelings. I don't know why I have to talk about my fears and resentments. I don't know why I have to admit to God to another human and myself the exact nature of my wrong. I don't know why I have to humbly ask God to remove my shirt. I don't know why I have to keep an open mind. Who in the world would ever want to make amends to everyone I harm? Why would I have to make direct amends whenever do so? Why, 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 why? 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 Because you're still high. Why? Because your buddy died last week. Why? Because you can't see your children. Why? You're 38 years old and you're dead broke and you're living on the streets and you should be in prison. That's why. So the Bible says this, 
Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Maybe tonight some of us need to turn and say, forgive me, God, for not taking advantage of the people that you sent me to help me. Forgive me, God, for being a twisted hater of that sober house guy that just tried to help me. Forgive me, God, for that treatment counselor. Forgive me, God, for that police officer that pulled me over that I resent to this day. Maybe you need to ask God for forgiveness that you have rejected all the help that he has sent you. Because he's been sending you help for years. For years. He would send me help and I would reject it. But one thing I never did, because I was raised differently. When I got high in that halfway house and they kicked me out, I just left. I didn't talk smack about them. I didn't get in the manager's face. I just left because I had an understanding. It's me. It ain't you. And I ain't ready to quit. I have a level of understanding at that, and that's the understanding that I was raised with. So we end with this, Proverbs 19. Learn to love yourself and go all in. The one who gets wisdom loves life. The one who cherishes, I cherish understanding, um, will soon prosper. As we close, I ask you this question. Do you have enough understanding tonight to wait to get what God has for you? God bless you.